about it. And then as far as I know, it's been both. So I'm really kind of jacked out about this message. And so uh, I, I, want to, I want to encourage you on this message to do a few things. If there's something in there that you are really blessed with, I'll put, I'm so tempted sometimes to get a shout button. And I, because sometimes it, it helps me, right? And get a shout button or anything, but I'm, there's got to be one on, on Amazon somewhere. And so uh, there's going to be a shout button, amen, and a shock button. And the shock buttons are under your seat. So whenever I hear a shock button, you go, hallelujah! And maybe it'll just be Pentecostal one way or the other. So we're excited about that. But this message here, um, I want to kind of continue a little bit on with this David uh, thought process. And I mean, no, there's, there, if there's 66 times that David is, is, or there's 66 chapters in the Bible that specifically mention David, then there's really something in there that... that we can learn from him, right? And um, so this week I want to talk a little bit about that. And I, I've actually posted some stuff in our, in our Facebook group and just some thought-provoking things. But here's the quote of the week. And um, the Holy Spirit is in you and he wants out. I mean, sometimes we just can find the Spirit of the Lord in our own little cave. He's in you like a river. Not a lake, Bill Johnson said. And I was looking at that this morning, and I, I, I wish he wouldn't have used the word lake and, and, and put the word swamp in there instead, because he's a river. We used to live in Cambridge, Ontario, and we had 48 acres of environment, environmentally protected land, and this land was really nothing more than a breeding ground for skiers. And you couldn't do nothing with it. I mean, a river is going somewhere. It's when it has a destination, and a swamp it just stays there. It's like skeeters, frogs, fungus, mildew. It just smells, and it's really nasty. How many of when the Spirit of the Lord is inside of a person, it's no longer a swamp, ladies and gentlemen. It is a river. The river of life begins to flow in and out. And so I love what Bill Johnson said. The Holy Spirit is in you, and he wants out. And he's in you like a river, not a lake. Amen? So uh, whenever, you, whenever you see quotes that you really like, Put it in your journal. Put it in there. And I know that it will be a blessing for you. So I want you to go to Psalm 142 uh, today. And um, if, if I could have your permission, um, it is 1130 uh, Atlantic time, which is really an hour later than Eastern time, which I'm accustomed to. And uh, so theoretically, that gave me a little bit longer to bring this message, I, I think. But I've got some stuff here. And if I go a little bit more than 30 minutes... Is that, is that going to mess up your Sunday? Is that going to mess up the Scarecrow Festival? I mean, seriously. All right? No, it's not a stupid thing. And uh, so, but we're going to it anyway for some reason. I don't know why. Because I wake up in the morning and she thinks I look like a Scarecrow anyway. So why go to myself? And, hey! You behave. I don't even know who you are and you're here to How many, speaking of, since you decided to do that, I mean, didn't even recognize Tom with his new, you know, hairdo, right? <laughs> or his new hair color. And speaking of something spectacular, something is happening tomorrow. I forgot. I totally forgot. And it's Aunt B's birthday tomorrow. So those of you who are watching all over Facebook and things of this nature, we have a special way of singing happy birthday to people who are seasoned in their season of sanctuary. And for those of you who know, and you guys will figure this out very quickly, a happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you every day of the year. May you feel Jesus near a happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you, the best year you've ever had. The best year you've ever had. The best year you've ever had. No, you already had a chance to talk. What? Who? Oh, happy birthday to you. A happy birthday to you. Every day of the year. May you feel Jesus there. A happy birthday to you. A happy birthday to you. The best year you've ever had. The best year you've ever had. The best year you've ever had. Anybody else? What? When's your birthday? Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, every day of the year, baby, Jesus, baby, happy birthday to you, 
today, Timmy has to take you out for a special dinner for your birthday at Turkey Burger or somewhere like that. All right, let's dive into this thing because that just ate up five minutes of my preaching. <laughs> Psalm 42, verse 1 to 7, and I want to talk to you today on a title, Caught in a Cave. I have my little picture up there. Where did it go? Here's my caught in a cave. I feel like I'm cool. Oh, there he is. David, <laughs> caught in a cave. So here's the question. What do you do when you're called to be a king, but you're confined in a cave? How many have ever thought about that? What do you do when you're called to be a king, but you're confined in a cave? Psalm 142. And David is conflicted in this particular portion of scripture and Psalms is, is just this incredible life journey of, of David. And he's up and down. He's roundabout. He's confused. He's conflicted. You know, he, he's just messed up. And, he, and he's crying out to the Lord. And it sounds a little bit like some of us sometimes. But in Psalm 142, 1, 7, he says, I cry out to the Lord and I plead for the Lord's mercy. I pour out my complaints before him in which I can probably understand a little bit in this first verse. Where he says, I cry out to the Lord and I plead for the Lord's mercies. But the last time I remember singing or hearing something about David, David would always say, you know, and his praise will continually be in my mouth. And I was thinking, well, if praise is continually being in my mouth and that's what David is speaking, then why is he complaining when he should be singing? He says, I pour out my complaints before him and I tell him all my troubles. And when I'm overwhelmed, you alone know the way that I should turn. And wherever I go, my enemies have set traps for me. I look for someone to come and help me, but no one gives me a passing thought or no one will even help me. And, and no one cares a bit what even happens to me. And then I pray to you, O Lord, and I say, you're my place of refuge and you are all I really want in life. Hear my cry, for I'm very low and rescue me. For my persecutors, for they're too strong for me. Bring me out of prison so that I can thank you, or in some translations would say praise your name. And the godly will crowd around me, for you are good to me. And so when I highlighted you're good to me up there, it was interesting because in one moment he's saying that you're good to me, but in the next moment that he's complaining. How many have ever complained to the Lord when you know that He's still been good to you? And then sometimes it doesn't even make sense that, you know, God, if you're so good, like, it'd be like if I went to Cheryl. Well, Cheryl, I told her the other night, because she made the most incredible lasagna the other night. And that'll just make me say, take me to your leader. And she was, she was just awesome. And I was just thinking, I thought, you know, for 37 years, you know, I've never ever come home to macaroni and cheese. The crap dinner, or peanut butter and jelly. You know, in all these years, she's always come up with something wonderful. But that would be like me saying, thank you, Lord, for my master chef, and then complaining. Well, wait a minute, because I do that sometimes. Um, because sometimes she makes all this healthy stuff, and sometimes, you know, a guy just needs a little bit of fat. I mean, you know, a bottle of Crisco and a straw. You know, something like that, because, you, you know, daily injections of cholesterol will lower your old brand level. We all understand that, but she's been healthy, and I just, you know, sometimes she, and I would just complain right now, because I, I can complain, because I don't know, Lord, my praise continually, it, it, praise is in my mouth, but she's healthy, and she buys the most nastiest, grossest crackers, and they taste like the bottom end of a shoe. It's like a sweater. And it's like, well, you need fiber. And I said, well, I don't want the. And she's like, try this rosemary infected keel crap. I mean, I don't know any other word to put it. And I know that's not the right word to use at the pulpit. But literally, that's what that stuff tastes like. But, you know, I'm like, ooh, my gosh. And so, how I many of that's the time Pastor Bobby goes on a fast for 10 minutes? Or at least, or at least you know, sneak some Cheetos somewhere. But. It's crazy. And so David is going, God, you're really good to me. But then he goes, I pour out my complaints before him. And the, 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 the back story of this psalm is in 1 Samuel 22, 5. It says, but the prophet Gad said to David, do not stay in the stronghold. Go in the land of Judah. So David left and he went to the forest 
thereof. And we'll get to that a little bit later on. But, but David is, is complaining before the Lord. And obviously praise was not continually in his mouth that day. And, and David was looking for help, but he only found hardship. He was harassed and he was haunted by his own heart. And he was voicing how he really felt before the Lord as if God didn't already know. And I don't know if you guys have ever done that and you're complaining before God and you're, you're saying, don't you know what I'm going through? And he says, yes, well, as a matter of fact, I kind of really do. And I was thinking about all this because we are, the body of Christ is constantly complaining about something. Because I don't think that we are ever really satisfied. Where is it in Song of Song where it says, you know, that nothing is new under the sun. And we're always constantly whining and complaining about something. But I remember, and maybe you remember as a child, hearing something like, quick, maybe you can fill in the blanks, quit crying, or I will give you something to cry about. Isn't it amazing you know, when you think about David and how he's complaining that maybe, maybe God just might give him something worth complaining about? And how many of us don't, we don't go to God in sincerity for fear that he will give you what you're complaining about. But the big question is, why is David complaining when he says that you're so good to me? If we can't complain to God in his presence, listen, if we can't complain to God in his presence, then I'm not going to feel confident to come to him at all. Because he understands our complaints. He understands our struggles. He understands where we're at. He understands our shortcoming. He understands every bit of it. But the presence of God is not the place to bypass your emotions. It's where you process them. It's where you lay them all down. It's the place where, where, you, the place where you are right now is the key to open up His presence. And what, what, what do you mean? Because the key is not found in your future because you're not there yet. It's not found in your past because you can't change that. But it's right now. It's right where we are. And it's in the presence that change is made to erase the past and embrace the future. That's why decisions determine the direction of your destiny. I had a friend back in business days, Jeff Olson, and he would always say, you know, live for now. Live for the now. You can, and, and there, there are people, I mean, you know, you know, we love the prophetic and we love all that. And there's people that are out prophesying what's about to happen. What's about to happen. But here is a truth bomb. Y'all ready for a truth? Here's a truth bomb. Here's a truth bomb coming. You are living in the day that somebody was prophesying 10 and 20, 30 years ago what was going to happen in the future. You're living in the future today. You're living in the fulfillment of somebody else's prophecy back then. But why is it that we're always content of, of forecasting the future when we can't live in the reality of now? I don't know. But prophecy is awesome. I love that God is about to do. I'm not, hear my heart, I'm not necessarily interested in what God is about to do. Because that puts me in preparation for doing nothing and sitting on my bum while I'm waiting for God to show up and do something. I'm more interested in what is God doing right now. And as we live in the now, then we can rejoice on what somebody prophesied years ago. Oh, I don't know. Thank you. Who said that? Who said that? Oh, Allison, there's my girl. I knew you came here for a reason. Hear my cry, he says. You can think of many things when your mouth is closed, but you can only think of one thing at a time when your mouth is speaking. And so what I mean by that is, you know, you, you, you can try to count to ten forwards in your brain. And try that. Try counting the ten forwards in your brain and then saying one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten verbally. You can't. You can sit here and you can pray. Even maybe during worship, your mind is all over the place. And you're thinking about David, you're thinking about the Scarecrow Festival, you're thinking about the river, and we're thinking about kayaking, except not in the Lahey River because you're going to scoop poop. And so you're thinking about all kind of stuff there. But when you're praising God, you can't think of anything else when you're praising God. And then well, that's where David was. He said, if praise is continually in my mouth, then he wouldn't be complaining. So something had to change in there. Something had to be happening with David because it says that he was, he was complaining. 
The presence of God is where you get permission to pour yourself out. When you're in the presence of God, that's where you have the permission to pour yourself out because he gets it. He understands. And when you shout with praise, it's going to stop your mind from wandering. And David had to verbally remind himself how good he has it when God was good to him. When you begin to verbally remind yourself all the good things God did for you, there's no way that you can spend the rest of the afternoon complaining. Oh, I don't know, but they get this back to Ontario. Psalm 139, it reminds you. He said, Oh Lord, you've examined my heart and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down, you know when I stand up, you know my thoughts, even when they're far away. You see me when I travel, you see when I'm rest alone, you know everything that I do. And all throughout the, that whole verse, it's like, go on. It's like, just for time's sake. You, know, there's, you can read it for, your, for yourself. In Psalm 139, it's just this reminder of what God was doing for him. And in verse 18 of 139, he says, I can't even count them all. They outnumber the grains of the sand. And when I wake up, you're still with me. Even in the midst of our chronic complaining, he is still with us. He never abandons us when we are complaining. And have you ever had your calling? You know that you're called to do something. But somehow or other, your complaining overrides your calling. Oh, I don't know, because you're, you're so focused on what God is not doing that you can't focus on what God is doing. Have you ever had your calling in conflict with your circumstance? David was coming to grips with the reality of his situation in a cave. And I don't know if you've ever been there in your own little private prison where you're wondering, God, where are you? Have you abandoned me? Have you left me? You know, where is my refuge? But quite often it's in the cave that your confidence is found all over again. And there's the reality. So there's the reality of sorrow. That David has been brought to the absolute bottom of his life. Not that any of us have ever been there. He's hurting. And he's broken. And he's defeated. And the crown prince of Israel is now living in a cave. He doesn't rest his head on some awesome bed in the palace. But on cold rocks in a cave. He no longer sleeps in the bed of the princess, but he, he seeks rest in the damp darkness of a forsaken cave. I don't know if you've ever been there. He doesn't find comfort in the house of a friend, but he fights loneliness in a deserted, dirty cave. I don't know if we've ever been there. There's the reality of suffering, and, and God allowed David to come to this cave so that David might not learn to lean on the props that he had. What are those props? His friends, his family, his finances, his fame, the flesh, or even the future. That David was taught through his sufferings to totally lean on the Lord. And you see, God, listen, listen, God was not trying to destroy David. He was not trying to discipline David. God was attempting to develop David into the man of God that the Lord wanted him to become. Because it's in those dark, dingy, gross times. And when we think that God has abandoned us, He has not abandoned us. Because it's in the darkest of the time that His brightness shines even more. Amen. And I don't know, but the same is true in our lives. Because it teaches us, to, it teaches us to, to, to look at Him. And not to look at our circumstances. And the Lord uses the hardships of life to develop us. And that's not fun. None of us want to go through stuff just to be developed. But how many know God still has the bigger picture in mind? God does not do this to break us. He does it to build us. However, times of breaking up and tearing down often come before times of building up. And there are some things in our lives, guys, that it has to be broken. It has to be torn down. There's some stuff that old Joyce Meyer used to call stinking thinking. Sometimes some of the stinking thinking has to get out so we have some godly thinking. We don't look no longer at Bridgewater. Oh, look at Bridgewater. Look at the strong. Look how bad they are. Look at the sinners in the area. I look at it going, man, there's a whack load of potential. And God can do something great. It's amazing what happens when our, our interpretation of our vision begins to change and is filtered through the, through the eyes of the Lord. Can you imagine what it would be like? I've often said you get a burden for the lost when you walk with the lost. The cool thing about where these guys came from in Bradford, it was my best friend. He was in, 
you know, Brian Beatty, and we would always have friends, we would always go way, I mean, Brian and I were like, way, 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 way back. And Brian would always go, so I said. I mean, we would always be so dumb together. And we, we would, he, he would come up to, to London, and we were doing flipping, what do we call it? Flipping fathers, no, flip, flipping from the father. It wasn't like we were doing spiritual gymnastics. You know, on Friday nights, we would get our grills out and do hamburgers, flipping from the father. And Brian, they were trying to find some way where they could have an impact on Brantford, Ontario. So he came down one night, I think, with, with um, Dave Carroll and saw us doing hamburgers. And hey, yeah, we could do that. And so all of a sudden, they decided that they were doing that. But they've taken this thing to, like, you know, steroid land. I mean, they've taken it to a whole massive, you know, other level. But they were out ministering from, you know, 8 to, like, 11. And, and we don't have this here, but if you're in the bigger cities and stuff... Where there's you know bars and whatnot going on, you know you have eight to eleven, but after eleven o'clock, there's a whole different group of people that comes out. The animals come out after midnight. <laughs> but it's amazing how many people that they were able to minister to over a hamburger, because there's something about a hamburger and a hug that can turn somebody from you know devilly to heavenly. And God begins to do something because they see exactly how much you care. And David was struggling with all this. And David was going, you know, through all this stuff. And, and it was a time that we didn't tear. The cool thing about Brian, he didn't tear down his city. He built up his city. And then he started doing Frosty Fest. And forget that. I'm like, you can have that. I don't know nothing to do with coal. You know, you can do Heat Fest. Maybe we can do something like that. But forget this Frost. But he was out there doing all this kind of crazy stuff. And now he's involved in the government or the local government and all this kind of stuff. And it's really awesome. But... He was, Brian was on this, on this search to have an impact. And that's what I really appreciate about that. And, and David is going through this as well. And he's, he's, he, his suffering had led him on a search. The problem is, Goliath is from Gath. And he has to hide in the place of his enemy. And David can't stay in that place because... Because now he's struggling because he's threatened by Saul and he has to go deal with the land of Gath where Goliath was from and he, and he feels like he really can't find anywhere to rest his head. And some people just struggle to fit in anywhere. I don't know if you guys have ever gone through something like that, but the way you escape could also lead you into greater captivity. David had some crazy decisions that he had to make. And it's important to know that when you, when you go and when you run, sometimes you just might have to stay and not be tempted to leave just because the grass may be greener on the other side. Because as the old saying goes, the grass is only greener on the other side because it's layered with that. Because sometimes what you run to will end up Potentially running you. And you end up, you go from one cave to another cave. And you're captured and you're confined. And then you realize that now you're, you're separated. That brings us to number three, the reality of separation. That David's been cut off from his family, his friends, and his followers. And he, he's in a place, yikes, he's in a place that prevents fellowship with others. And David was brought to the place where he had nothing and no one but the Lord. And that cave was a place of separation. I don't know if you've ever been there. But we often find ourselves in caves, don't we? And that God will sometimes bring us to the place where we are alone with him and shut off from the rest of the world. And here's the big statement today that the absence, um, how do I say it? The silence of God is not the absence of God. The silence of God is not the absence of God. And we often find ourselves there alone and, and we're full of fear sometimes, but we know that God's blessing is with us even in the cave. David was alone in the cave. Jacob was, Jacob was alone in his tent. Elijah was alone by the brook. Job was, was, was alone surrounded by his friends. And Moses was alone on the backside of the mountain. And Jesus was alone in the agony of Gethsemane. But the loneliness, is, the loneliness of God doesn't mean that he's abandoned you. Each of us, each of us we've experienced this, this stuff in our lives all the time. 
And the lessons that are learned in the dark, I'm sorry, there are lessons that are learned in the dark that cannot be learned in the light. Because sometimes when we are in the light and when everything is going on, then correct me if I'm wrong, but we have a tendency not to lean on the Lord as much as we lean on our understanding. When scripture says, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. But why is it sometimes that we are we are stuck? In a cave because we're afraid to stick our neck out. Faith is stepping out on nothing and believing that you're going to land on something. And some of us are so afraid to step out of faith that we're 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 um we're um we're we're, we're, we're um we're, we're okay with, with with the cave. The weird thing about the story is that David is not surprised by the enemies that surrounded him. Listen to this: he's not surprised by the enemies that surrounded him. Because he's in this cave and, and he's supposed to go in this cave and there's all kind of stuff going on. He's not surprised by the enemies that surrounded him, but he's surprised that by the friends who didn't surround him. David is shocked that no one is around him who really cares. And then his big question is, where has the compassion for the king gone? I don't know if you've ever had that. And I have people... Even nowadays, that they'll call me and they're like, how are you? And I know good and well going well. They don't care how well I am. They just want to get me into something. Because they know that I was successful in business. And they're like, what's the next shiny lure? Hey, how are you? I haven't heard from you in years. And all of a sudden, I'm your sugar daddy. Oh, I don't know. David is shocked. That no one is around him and really cares. And he's thinking, oh, where's all the, where's the compassion going? But you say, well, David, he, David wasn't alone in the, in the cave because his brothers and, and father, the, the, the household was there. And they went down there to meet him. And it says that in 1 Samuel 22, 2, I think it is. He says that his family and his brothers, they went to the cave to be with him. But here's the big question. How many of you know that there's a difference between being surrounded and being supported? Oh, I don't know. It's 12 o'clock. I got to get this done. David was surrounded by family, but he wasn't supported. I don't know if you guys have ever gone through that, but I have. Everyone in the cave needed something from David. And a crowd around you doesn't mean that they got your back. Just because you have a crowd doesn't mean that they got your back. We're going to be developing a program not too long. And it's called uh, Need Prayer. And then on the back would be a, a, a shirt. And it says WGYB. We got your back. Need Prayer. It'll go on Facebook. It'll go on social media. All of there. Need Prayer. We got your back. Impact Church. And how many realize, you know, if you can pray for the heart and pray for the needs and pray for whatever, whatever, whoever, then there might be a good chance that they might come. But how many realize that that the importance is not that they show up here, but that you show up there? This is a building that house you. We are his church. All this place does is keep us warm and keep us cool. And speaking of, we're actually working on getting some new heat pumps up here. So that's going to keep you, for those of you who are visiting, it's hotter than Helen's house in here in, in, in the summertime. Trust me, your sweat gives birth to sweat, but it won't be happening. We'll have air conditioning in here, and it's going to be awesome. And everybody who's who's grinned and bared it and left said, "Amen." It's awesome that you're doing it, Pastor Bobby. It's really cool. So here's the big question: Who really cares nowadays? What happens, you know, when we get our there? When we had our last church, you know, I, I had a heart scare, and um, I might I might just have to finish this. This is crazy. Um, we had a heart scare, and. Um, I had got up after church on, on Sunday. My heart started going 1,000 miles an hour. I was sweating, numb, all this kind of stuff. Long and short, I had to go to the hospital. They, they said, you know, we're going to give you adenosine or we're going to give you the paddles. And I'm like, well, I don't want the paddles. I, didn't want... I said, what's adenosine? He said, well, that's going to make you feel like your heart's going to stop. I'm like, well, forget that. I, I said, what well, if it doesn't come back? Well, we'll give you something so that it come back again. I said, uh, homie ain't taking that risk. I'm not rolling that guy. I'll pay some refusal treatment. So I get into the ER, and here comes all the electric. I looked like Frankenstein at an electrical convention. I mean, it was like, it was crazy what was going on. 
Come to find out it was all stress. And then there were people at the church that they really didn't give a rip because their, their thought was, hey, well, you're gone. Somebody else is coming to fill your spot. And I don't know if you've ever felt like that sometimes, that, that you're, you're, you're doing so much for everybody else, but then you're saying, what about me? I don't know if you've ever, maybe you're a lot more, you know, stable than I am and was, but, you know, the fact is that they were always looking for someone to come and to help us. And we're, we're us, and it's important to realize that your current really in reality is an opportunity for revelations to be revealed. Your current reality is an opportunity for revelations to be revealed. The greatest revelations are revealed in the cave of your private prisons. Oh, I don't know. Can I go a little bit longer? Or do you, you guys got somewhere to go? Tim says, Tim says, I'm preaching, I'm getting it somewhere. Here we are. So let's talk about it really quick. The rev girls, am I okay? Can I go a little bit? I know you drove a half an hour on these days. Are you, are you okay? You know, are you okay? But I just I just want to make sure, you know, that. Some people might have, you know, a bloodstream and they might need to get a coffee. Glenn, you okay back there? Yeah. <laughs> one and a half pages. One and a half pages, but I got more. Jehovah Java, my reviver. I just needed that. So there's the revelations of the cave, the revelations of this call. As David's props begin to be taken away one after another, he probably began to doubt the promises that God made him. A long time ago. And after a while, people began to show up at David's cave, first his family cave, then the defeated, the downtrodden, and you know, men of Israel began to show up, you know, David's David's army there. David's family came because they were afraid of Saul. The rest came because they believed that David was God's man for the future, man of faith and power. They all cast their lot with David, and God used this this motley crew of people to show David that he still had a plan for his life. And he realized that even though Elijah had his ravens and Moses had a burning bosom, Jesus had an empty tomb, that God has a way of showing us that, that it's still going to be all right. Whatever you're going through is still going to be okay. And then there was the revelation of, of his character. And this is really, really important. And the notes are actually on the Facebook page. But I want you to realize that instead of breaking under the pressures of the moment, David's heart was revealed. And the leader rose to challenge and lead. But it took pain and problems to squeeze that out of him. You've got to understand that character is greater than charisma. Character is developed when nobody else is around. Character is a description of a person's attributes, traits, or abilities. Charisma is a special personal quality or power of an individual making him capable of influencing or inspiring large numbers of people. But charisma is a gifting. And just because someone is gifted with influence, wealth, and personality does not mean that person pleases God. Charisma is what you already have. Character comes from within you. Failure. I'm sure David thought about it many times. Failure is an event, not a person. We all fail sometimes. Winston Churchill said, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. Success builds character, but failure reveals it. And David, in his own little private cave, was having his character develop. Because David wasn't much of a charismatic guy. But it was in that cave that the character was being developed. And then there was the revelation of his commitment. And we all know that, you know, David was committed to, to everything and just to kind of move on. There were the refreshments of the cave. So we can talk about that a little bit. These men were gathered, that gathered themselves around David were there because they were, they were fed up with Saul. They didn't like him anymore. The distress came to David. And this word means to be under stress and under pressure. And we're also told that those were there, uh, they were in debt. <laughs> Good speak. A lot of folks. The speech of those who could not pay their bills. The discontented also came. And this refers to those who were, were bitter and who'd been mistreated. And here was a group of hundreds of people who had suffered under the tyranny and taxation of Saul. And they're all fed up. And they go to David because they believe that he is God's man for Israel. Why are people coming here? Not because of us. 
All we've done is open up the door and let the presence of the Lord show up. And God's doing something. And I'm sure that David could, he could not see in his life what they saw. And at that time, David could only see defeat and discouragement. And while David could only see the cave, those who came to him could see the crowd. They saw something in David that David couldn't see in himself. And they gathered themselves around him and believed in him, even though he was down. Guys, that's exactly what we need. We need people that will come around us, even though when we feel that we're down. And I will tell you this very carefully in 1 Samuel 22 too. He said, all those that were in distress or in debt or disconnected gathered around him, and he became their commander. So it was about 400 of them. And so all I've got to say in regards to that is be careful when you complain. <laughs> because the company that God sends you to your pay may not be the ones that you want for your next convention. He was complaining. God, I'm alone. God, I'm abandoned. And God says, fine. I'm going to answer your prayers. I'm going to give you something worth crying about. I'm going to give you those in debt. I'm going to give you those distressed. I'm going to give you those contented. And he's going, seriously? Can't you give me some more mature people? But what David didn't know was that these same men would be the ones that would bring him to the throne. Sometimes the people who say they've got your back, they don't. And the only way that you can tell is when your back is left up against the wall, do they show up? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Let's go through some stuff and we're almost done. We'll skip that. And we'll just get to the good stuff. Actually, the whole thing is good. But you can, it just drives me nuts. I hate clocks. Uh, let's wrap this up. Cheryl, come on. That would be a good sign. I remember that song. Like a bridge over troubled water, I lay. Can I just say that you're a bridge over the troubled water, bridge water? You're a bridge. You guys. Liverpool, Chester, wherever y'all are from. We're the bridge over troubled waters. We're the connectors. David was a bridge for his family, and even when they were not with him in the beginning, David was with them in the end. Because David, David's family came to him in that cave. But they really weren't with him. They really didn't support him. David's mighty men were there. It was all awesome. But the coolest part is in 1 Samuel 23, 3, where it says, from David, from there, the king, David went to Mizpah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, would you let my father and mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do with me? David was destined to be king but right now, right then, he was in a cave of confusion. He was called to be a king, but he was still stuck in a cave. And in verse 4 says, So he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him as long as David was in the stronghold. Look it up. Stronghold is a fortified place where opposing forces can get to you. David felt safe in the stronghold. But verse 5 says, But the prophet Gad said to David, Do not stay in the stronghold. Go into the land of Judah. So David left. The stronghold is a setup. Or was a setup. Because you think that there's safety and security there. And if you're not careful, careful the cave will protect you. But it will also entrap you. And the prophet says to David, I'm done. It's like, this time I'm done. Because I skipped the words. The prophet said to David, he said, Judah, I want you to go to Judah. Why go to Judah? Because Judah is the place of praise. And the Hebrew name for Judah 
literally means thanksgiving. It means to thank or to praise. And it was in the cave and from the cave that David carried the conviction of, of being king. And David went from prison to praise because he listened to the prophets. I think I might have worded it a little bit different this morning. It was in the, uh, go to the next one. I think there's, you know, did I even put it on there? Maybe I didn't. Maybe I just wrote it, wrote it here. David went from prison to praise because he listened to the prophet. I don't think it would last long, but I'm done. Did Doug get something? I mean, a little bit? I know him a little bit? Yeah. Ten minutes, I mean, seriously. But here's the thing, and we're going to practice this right now. Some of y'all just need to stand up and you just need to shout because God is taking you from your cave out of your prison and into the praise and he's taking you from caves and he's telling you that you need to go to Judah. You need to go to Judah. You need to go to praise. And sometimes there was a commercial years ago and it, it was about getting stains out of your clothes. And it says sometimes you just need to shout it out. Sometimes you just need to make a declaration of your faith and just be a little bit more aggressive and just begin to shout it out and not be a consumer of information, but that you begin to declare the information that you receive and you begin to release that in the atmosphere. When I was in South Africa, man, it was awesome because we were just declaring, declaring and decreeing things in the atmosphere. And it's amazing what happens when the word gets out of the atmosphere, what God does, the supernatural becomes the natural. And then when you show up, supernatural comes with you and you become a supernatural being and not just a church goer. Whoops, did I say that? Let's all stand if you don't mind. And Peter, come on up. We probably need to shut off the little Facebook thing going on in the live video. But I just want, if you don't mind, I just want us just, just for a little bit. I mean, can I just ask you for a little bit? Just a little bit. Lean to your neighbor and say, we can do this just for a little bit. Right? Can we just lift our hands? Can we just sing that song that we were talking about this morning? Can we just lift our hands up and praise? Can we praise our way out of a prison? Can we just praise our way out of a cave? Can we just be launched into the realm of a supernatural and catapulted into his glory because of praise? Praise. And that's what's out of prison. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Praise is a highway. Get me off this sideway. Yes. Praise is a highway.
Still going. 